Hey guys, Max here, and this is your daily market update for yesterday, the 3rd of February. It has been a crazy day. Markets tanked as we thought they would, but there is now a ray of light in the form of Amazon earnings, which came out after the markets closed. Other than that, we have the Bank of England's interest rate hike to talk about and a couple other things, so let's get right into it. Now, I said the markets tanked, but just how bad was it? Well, as is so often the case, the Nasdaq got hit the hardest, falling by 3.7% and not even getting close to breaking even at any point during the day. The S&P 500 followed in the same sort of direction and fell 2.5% and the Dow Jones fell 1.4%, so business as usual if it were still January. What we saw was basically the riskiest assets falling the most, the tech and speculative stocks getting hit the hardest as Facebook's awful earnings sparked fears about how the rest of the market and the economy is going to perform. Now this day was so bad that it was only beaten in recent years by the worst days of the crash that preceded the COVID pandemic and the lockdowns. We are going to go into more detail regarding these tech companies in a moment, but first, what else happened across the markets? Well, the dollar fell a little bit again, this time 0.3% against the spot index. Bond yields in the US, but across the world as well, rose a pretty large amount for one day as new inflation fears, but also, more importantly, fears of hawkish monetary policy changed. The US 10-year Treasury yield rose 5 basis points and the British 10-year yield rose 11 basis points all in one day. Oil prices saw a major spike as well, rising over 2% yesterday alone. WTI crude oil is now sitting above $90 a barrel, which we were talking about as a possibility just a couple of days ago. Kathy Wood just might be on suicide watch. Now, gold saw a pretty stable day, sitting just above $1,800 an ounce, and the crypto markets had an okay day actually, but a very volatile one. The markets were rising up and down. Bitcoin reached a low of just about $36,000, but as of making this video right now, it's sitting at about $37,000. Now Ethereum saw the same treatment, lots of volatility, some swings up and down, but right now it's sitting above $2,600, almost exactly where we left it the day before. Altcoins as well, surprisingly enough, didn't see any major shifts, especially when you consider the fact that a $300 million heist just took place on a DeFi protocol that links Solana and Ethereum. And to be honest, I would have expected some kind of major market reaction from that. Now, if you haven't heard about that hack, then you can just Google Solana Ethereum wormhole and I'm sure it will come up. And I'll probably have a quick video coming out in a few days on my crypto channel explaining what happened as well. So link is down below in the description. Now, there will also probably be some people screaming FUD down below in the comments purely because I even mentioned the existence of a hack that just saw $300 million stolen in an instant. Now, why did the markets crash? Well, it's because Facebook tanked at the market open, just as we expected. Of course, we spoke quite a lot about Facebook and their poor earnings yesterday, so we're not going to go into too much detail here. But Facebook had poor earnings. They spent a lot of money on the metaverse, and the number of people using Facebook has actually started to decline for the first time ever. The stock ended up falling 26% for the day, erasing, I think, about $240 billion worth of value. To put that into perspective, that one company alone yesterday lost more than 400 of the 50 companies that make up the S&P 500 are even worth. Now, it was an awful day and everyone was piling on Facebook. All over Twitter, all over Bloomberg and CNBC, there were articles and people saying that Facebook is on the decline now, that it's reached its peak and it's no longer a growth company, it's a shrinking one. Now Zuckerberg came out and told his staff to focus on their work and not pay attention to stock prices, but that's a difficult thing to do when 60% of your compensation is in stock options and the value of those options just fell by 26%. Now this crash caused worries everywhere else as well. The idea being that maybe the investing environment has changed as a result of these poor earnings. So we saw routes across the board, particularly with companies that are also reliant on Apple's hardware, basically apps who run on the Apple App Store and companies who might be competing with Google as far as advertising goes. Now, two other major companies that are worth talking about are Snapchat and Amazon, as they both crashed during the day because of Facebook's crash. Snapchat fell 23% yesterday as well, as there were fears that they would have seen the same problems that Facebook did with Apple's moves to limit the data they can harvest and ad rates maybe being low too. Amazon as well had an awful day and fell 8%, which is a huge amount for a trillion dollar company, just on fears that their earnings would be poor and that they'd follow in Facebook's footsteps. Now, both of these companies then released their earnings reports after markets had closed and both actually did really well, meaning that they erased those gains in pre-market trading. 
Amazon rose 14% after falling 7 and Snapchat rose 59% after falling 23. So what actually happened in detail? Well, Amazon beat earnings expectations by a strong margin. Amazon's cloud computing as well posted really strong growth results and it's driving profit for the entire rest of the company. There are a couple concerns though, and they mostly revolve around the idea that cloud computing is the only part of the business that is actually profitable. The retail part of the business, which is obviously what we mostly know Amazon for, doesn't actually make any money, and supply side shortages and labor shortages are making that part of the business even harder and even more expensive. Now, if you look at the actual figures, it will look like Amazon beat earnings by 900%. They made almost $28 per share, but expectations were only $3.7 per share. But in reality, almost all of that comes from the sale of Rivian, the electric truck company. So the real earnings were about $4.5 per share, which is still a really strong beat, just not quite by 900%. As far as Amazon goes, basically the cloud part of the business is so good and growing so fast and so profitable that it carried everything else up with it, but the rest of the business really didn't post too stellar results to be honest. Now Snapchat of course also fell on fears that it would do poorly after Facebook did poorly, but earnings came out after hours and they were strong too. Snapchat actually posted its first ever profitable quarter ever, posting one cent of profit per share. It had 3 million more daily users than expected. It's been building up augmented reality with those filters on its app and advertisers like them. This is a feasible and likely outcome for the push towards the metaverse as well, not avatars and just a second life clone, which is what Meta seems to be going for. Now it will be interesting to see where Snapchat goes from here. To be honest, I think the 60% increase in valuation is a little bit strong. The results weren't that good, but it definitely did far better than expectations. Now of course we had the Bank of England raise interest rates by 0.25%, 2.5% which is the second consecutive rise and the question for the central bank was whether or not to raise it to 0.75% instead of 0.5%. In the end, four members of the board voted for 0.75 and five voted for 0.5, so the Bank of England is really quite hawkish right now. This is now the fastest tightening of monetary policy in the UK for over 20 years and it comes as a cost of living crisis emerges as well. Inflation is very high and living costs are rising. Caps on the costs of energy have just been increased as well and taxes have been raised in the form of national insurance. Now, most of this stuff is unavoidable. Energy prices are going to rise no matter what the government does. And the reality is, even if the government swallows up the cost up front, we the people will still be paying for that increase through our taxes. Interest rates as well obviously need to rise as we are now expecting inflation in the UK to peak above 7% in a few months time. This will hurt people, it will make it harder and more expensive just to live in the UK, but this is the result of irresponsible spending and if we don't tighten now, the problem and the pain will just be so much greater in the future. The only thing that is entirely unnecessary here is the rise of national insurance, which is a bit of a regressive tax and it's being raised because most people don't really see it as a tax, they don't notice it, so it's a sneaky way of raising tax revenue without as much scrutiny. But this is a very bad idea indeed. It's opposed pretty much across the board, left and right. No one likes this idea, but the Tories are pushing ahead with it anyway, for God knows what reason. Now, the ECB, the European Central Bank, got shown up to be entirely inept yesterday as they were wildly wrong on inflation estimates as they have been for 18 months now. One minor victory for the people of Europe, though, suffering under that regime is that Lagarde has shown the slightest bit of hubris by no longer ruling out an interest rate hike in 2022. She is though, of course, still plowing along with her asset inflation program and she still thinks that inflation is transitory no matter how many times she's proven wrong. Banks are now predicting rate hikes twice by the end of the year and the end of the bond buying program around that time as well. Better late than never, it's just a shame that so many Europeans have to suffer under high inflation because one woman has deluded herself into thinking that she's smarter than everyone else. Now, a very small point here, a bit off topic, but by God is a shared monetary policy across an entire continent just an awful idea. Now, in domestic British politics, we've spoken a little bit about the Prime Minister Boris Johnson's woes regarding these scandals from parties during lockdowns. And my position regarding all of this is basically to ignore what the media has to say, to ignore what the opposition has to say, and only listen to those in the Tory party, as they're the only ones who can actually influence what's going to happen here. Now, there is actually a major development in this story. Four senior aides to the Prime Minister have quit their jobs. These people worked directly with Boris Johnson, and they're unhappy with the scandals, and this is their way of applying pressure on him to leave. 
Again, this is the only news that really matters regarding this topic. Keir Starmer and Nicola Sturgeon and the BBC and The Guardian are going to scream bloody murder no matter what happens, but with a 76-seat majority, they can't change anything. Only the Tory party itself can institute change here, and it does seem to be going in that direction. Boris clearly doesn't want to leave office yet. Probably he wants to govern as a normal leader for at least a year or two with no COVID derailing his plans, but I fear it's just a bit too late for that. Now that is it for the day. I will be back the day after tomorrow. I'm going to miss tomorrow, I'm afraid. If you enjoyed this video, then leave a like and a comment to bless the YouTube algorithm. If you want more content like this, then check out our Patreon and join our community of investors. You get access to our Discord, loads of exclusive content like insight into my portfolio and buy and sell alerts for all my own investments. It is now February, so if you've been waiting to join, now is the perfect time. There's a link in the description to masterworks.io, a site that allows you to buy fractional shares of art from world-famous artists like Banksy, which can be a great way to diversify your portfolio with non-market correlated assets. It's completely free to sign up, you don't have to buy anything, you don't have to hand over any card information, so if that sounds interesting, then make sure to check it out. There's also a link in the description to BlockFi, which will give you up to $250 in free Bitcoin when you use it. You can also get 9% interest on stablecoins like USDC, which is a far higher rate than you'll get from any savings account these days. Just make sure not to use Tether. Thank you all for the support. Thanks for watching. Stay stoic. Until next time.